All right, everybody, welcome today uh, to Hatfield's research seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt, and I am the research program manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon, and we are excited that you are here. Um, this is a hybrid event, so we have folks online and folks in the room. For folks online, if you have any technical issues, Rose is our volunteer today. Go ahead and put your questions into the chat, and she will make sure that we know about it here in the room. Um, for folks in the room, if you have any questions, we'll be getting to those at the end of today's presentation. And we just ask that you raise your hand and either go to the mic up there or raise your hand and I'll bring this mic to you so those folks online can hear. Um, for those folks online, if you put any questions you have for the presenter at any time into the chat box, we'll get to those and make sure that we get those answered for you. Um, but again, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your time. I uh, wanted to make a couple of quick announcements. Um, um, for next week's seminar on January 12th, we'll have Sean Rowe here uh, from Oregon Sea Grant talking to us about his research on science communication, setting the stage for the Marine Science Day on April 8th, which will be back on site. So for us, um, that has been a delay due to COVID and we haven't had an on-site event in a few years, so we're very excited. So Sean's gonna talk to us about good ways to communicate with the public around the tabling kind of work that we do at uh, Marine Science Day. The other promo I wanted to do was just remind folks about the big film fest um, that is happening on um, this month on the 27th and 28th. Uh, tickets are available online if you go to HMSC's website. Go to visit Hatfield. There is a tab there where you can log on and you can see the schedule of all the films that we'll be having um, and buy tickets for that event. So we're hoping that you'll come to that. Um, but the reason that you're all here, both in the room and online, is for today's presentation. And so I'm going to actually hand this off to Jenny from ODFNW, who invited today's speaker, and let her introduce um, and kind of give a little background of why we have our speaker here today. All right, thank you. So today we're here because Ocean Acidification Day of Action is January 8th. So the Oregon Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Council is pleased to have Dr. Waldbuster speak in recognition of the day. January 8th was chosen as 8.1 is the current pH of the ocean, and the scientific community is aiming to keep the pH at that level. In addition to today's talk, all are welcome to attend an educational day at the Oregon Coast Aquarium on Sunday, January 8th, featuring ocean acidification interpretation and the opportunity to meet members of the OAH Council. Dr. George Waldbusser is an associate professor in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University. Beginning his work in ocean acidification in 2007, Dr. Waldbusser has been an integral member of the Ocean Acidification, or OA, community for over 15 years. While completing his PhD in biological oceanography in 2008 at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Studies, he researched OA impacts on shellfish in Chesapeake Bay. After completing his PhD and subsequently moving to Oregon, he quickly received a phone call from the Whiskey Creek Shellfish Hatchery asking for his help to learn more about their 2007 oyster hatchery collapse. Working with Dr. Burke Hales and the manager of Whiskey Creek Shellfish Hatchery, Dr. Alan Barton, Dr. Waldbuster solidified previous findings regarding ocean acidification and hatchery collapses, as well as determined why larval oysters are so sensitive to OA. To this day, he continues to work with oyster growers nationally and internationally, including working in an advisory role to the Cawthorn Institute in New Zealand. Dr. Waldbuster has strong interests in calcium carbonate cycling in temperate estuarine environments. His research at OSU has centered around ocean acidification impacts on bivalves, tidal flat ecology, and benthic ecology and sediment biogeochemistry. Please help me welcome Dr. Waldbusser. All right, thanks for that uh, nice introduction. Everybody can, I could hear it booming through the room. Great. Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming everybody online can hear me as well. So, um, so Jenny contacted me to see uh, about giving a talk or one of my students. And I sort of, I'm taking this opportunity to actually like, show you a lot of the Hatfield community what we've been doing for the last many years now. And also as a, as a motivation for me to get some of this stuff written up because you'll see we have work going back several years now that we haven't quite yet published. So it was fun to revisit some of this stuff. I wanna acknowledge a few collaborators, uh, Burke Hales, uh, Chris Langdon is in the room, 
as well as Jim Larzak has been working on some of the Aquino work I'll show you in a minute. There are probably dozens of students who've contributed to this work and I'll highlight them as we go through the talk as well. So, um, and then also uh, funding agencies and other support agencies like ODFNW, Climate Works, Sea Grant in particular has funded a, a number of the projects here as well as NOAA and some of the recent work I'm doing through the Oregon Ocean Science Trust. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just as a general outline, as I promised, SOS, shrimp, oysters, and shells. Uh, we're gonna do a really quick background on ocean acidification um, <clears throat> because mostly I feel like the chemistry gets lost most of the time anyway. So I'm gonna try doing like two slides. Here's ocean acidification. And then we'll talk about some of the larval shrimp work we've done here at Hatfield in 2018, 2019. Three different components of oyster juvenile work we've been doing or have done. And then um, a little bit of looking forward to shells and buffering. And so you've heard of ocean acidification or OA. <clears throat> There's this new thing maybe you've heard about called OAE, which is ocean alkalinity enhancement. And the idea is putting the buffering capacity back in the ocean. So if it's not confusing enough with the chemistry, we have OA and OAE to counter OA. <clears throat> okay, just to get everybody up to speed, uh, this is a basic chemistry lesson and that's an intended pun. Um, there's three really key critical components of uh, chemistry in the ocean. pH, which I think most people are familiar with, right? We have a pH scale. Anything below seven is considered acidic. Above seven is basic. The ocean, as noted, is around 8, 8.1 and decreasing uh, rapidly. <clears throat> so that's the ratio of acids and bases in the ocean. And the reason we focus so much on carbonate chemistry is because carbonic acid and bicarbonate and carbonate is the acid base chemistry that's most abundant in the ocean. So that's what's controlling the pH and the chemistry of the ocean. Here's the best way I can explain alkalinity. pH or acid tries to change the pH and alkalinity is resisting that change. So this becomes important because over time, as, as I'll sort of talk about in a second, uh, what we're doing is increasing the acid faster than the base. And there's a natural process which returns base to the ocean and it's why the ocean is salty ultimately. But that alkalinity comes from weathering processes that are quite slow. So alkalinity is an important concept. And then finally, corrosivity or saturation state. And this is effect effectively how many of the building blocks are there to make a mineral. And in this case, calcium carbonate. So it's calcium and carbonate ions. And because we have hundredfold or so more calcium ions, it's almost always the carbonate ion that lowers saturation state. Calcium is fairly stable in seawater. So <clears throat> they're different, right? These are all different properties of seawater, but they get lumped into what we think about as ocean acidification. And um, they're all measures of marine chemistry and they're all related through this carbonate chemistry. So here's like the one or two slide background on ocean acidification. So ocean acidification is a change in multiple carbonate chemistry parameters. It's changing pH, it's changing saturation state, it's changing the total amount of carbon in the ocean, it's changing the speciation of what's there. Uh, and so at the core of it, that means when we think about it from a physiological or an organism perspective, it's probably important that we think about it as a multi-stressor in itself. It's not, I think it's important if we wanna understand responses that we actually think about, how might saturation state and pH affect things differently or different aspects of physiology? <clears throat> pH is an indicator. Everybody, lots of people get this kind of turned around. pH is just merely the response. pH is just the ratio of how much acid and base is there. pH isn't the thing that's changing saturation state. It's the speciation. It's the amount of CO2 and the carbonate ions that are there. So it's just reflecting that change. And that's again, because the DIC or the amount of this CO2 bicarbonate and carbonate is really the balance of what's controlling the, the pH. Now acidification is happening. This shouldn't be any surprise uh, because we're putting more carbonic acid in the ocean as a function of our CO2 emissions, which go through this process and the dissociation where the CO2 reacts with water, creates a proton, and that's happening faster than the natural process that can put base in the ocean which primarily on long geologic timescales is weathering of rock on land. So 
<clears throat> all of that extra bicarbonate and carbonate in the ocean, most of that's come from the watersheds and it accumulates in the ocean over these long time scales. And so in a non-fossil fuel world, CO2 emissions become balanced with that because they're all tied through tectonic activity. So volcanoes are emitting more CO2, that's creating more land, which is exposing that to weathering, which creates more base that's coming down to the ocean. But what we're doing now is taking that material, the fossil fuels out of the earth, burning that and making that CO2 increase faster than it has in what we think maybe 65 million years. <clears throat> so acidification is a rate of change issue and global warming is a total CO2 issue, right? They're linked because they're all related to CO2 and some of the things we might be able to do with acidification could certainly help with global warming, but one is a problem of too much CO2, the other one is too fast of an increase. <clears throat> so here's an example to illustrate that point. This is a really nice paper that Barbell Honish published 10, I can't believe 10 years ago now. <clears throat> this is a, essentially a global earth model and it's showing what happens to the chemistry of the ocean, depending on how fast you increase the CO2 in the atmosphere. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the color coding, let's see if I got this right. There it is. Uh, this represents a doubling time <clears throat> from kind of current day to a, to a value. So in the end of the model, it's the same amount of CO2 that's there. And what happens if we double it in a time scale of 10 years or 100,000 years, right? And so what happens is this is that saturation state and pH, and this is sort of global ocean. So when we increase CO2 very rapidly, these warm colors, those two things are completely coupled and they're both changing at the same rate. Once we finish emitting that CO2, you'll see over time, actually the system becomes back to stabilizing and we sort of increase the pH again and the saturation state. But if we double the CO2, orders of magnitude slower, then actually the saturation state remains relatively constant and we get a minor decrease in pH. And uh, I think our emissions are in this kind of yellow, yellowish range. That's kind of our doubling projected timeline. So that's the fundamental core of the global problem, right? Now what happens is, how does that sort of relate to what organisms experience? And so this is some work a former PhD student of mine did, Steve Pacella. And um, it's a nice paper in, from 2018. And so we know that coastal areas, estuaries are quite variable. And the chemistry and the pH in those areas change quite regularly, diurnally, because CO2 is taken up by plants during the day. Those plants exhale at night as well as everything else throughout the day. And so adding that extra anthropogenic carbon into the system creates an amplification of the change. Right, and so the way that I've tried to sort of explain this sometimes is the way, same way of thinking about heat islands in cities, right? So we know the global temperature is changing, but we know in a city where you have all this urban and development concrete, those places get hotter faster. And so what the CO2 does in this in this scenario is, here we have like a pre-industrial, pre-industrial sort of range about. 8.3 or 8.03, sort of that would be like your nighttime, early morning respiration signal to about 8.37, full day, you've got good production, lots of plants growing. As we add more CO2, it takes away the capacity of the system to buffer that variability. So what happens is even though maybe we haven't changed the whole system as much, these kind of extreme events become more extreme. And so as we progress, the range of conditions get uh, changed more rapidly. And so ultimately in this system where Steve was working up in the Snohomish uh, watershed in a seagrass bed up there, um, the rate of change of the daily maximum or low, worse conditions were changing fat, twice as fast as the average condition, right? So we take a mean value and we say, okay, that's changing at this rate. The very worst of those conditions in the early morning are actually changing twice as fast because we're losing that buffering capacity to, to assimilate the metabolic carbon that's going in and out throughout the day. That makes it really hard as we start to try to figure out what this means for things that live in these complex dynamic environments. 
<clears throat> okay, so I'm going to jump to our organisms now. So um, this is some work that Michelle Nguyen, who was a student, uh, finished, defended her thesis in 2021. So she got into grad school and everything was great. And then it went south with the pandemic. And so fortunately, we managed to finish the experiments uh, in 2019. And we were actually out, we did a cruise with the ODF and W folks in March of 2020. And we were the last UNOLS vessel out on the ocean, which is like the last, it was 10, 12 years since I've been on a cruise. And so we're out on this cruise watching the news, wondering if we we're gonna come back to zombies on the dock or something, because it was just deteriorating. So, um, and then a number of other students, including some community college students who were uh, interns and helped us kind of uh, maintain the shrimp in the systems. And so just to give some context, this is a, a unitless graph of pounds and value of the fishery. It's the second most uh, economically important fishery in the state followed by or uh, after the Dungeness crab fishery. You can see there's a lot of variability in the catch uh, with El Nino events and La, uh, La Nina events, as well as this warm spell. And we think some of what we saw, we did that cruise, we found no shrimp larvae in the water that year. And it was, we think related to some of these heat wave events. Um, but what we did was actually back in the lab, looking at these guys, the Oregon pink shrimp, Pandalus jordani, of 13 larval stages. It was really neat. There was actually previous work done on these on the larvae here in the early 70s by a guy named Roth Lisberg, who was Charlie Miller's first PhD student, if that name's familiar, who wrote the book on biological oceanography, done somewhere in one of these buildings over here. And what, uh, what he did was really look at temperature responses and then field work, sort of looking at spatial distribution of larvae, the vertical migration and so on. And so part of the inspiration for this work, uh, these is, this is recruitment index values that the ODF and W use, um, working with Scott Groth, he had given me this data. And what I did was look at that and what they use is this Crescent City sea level height, which is effectively a measure of how strong the upwelling is. And so a lower sea level height means stronger upwelling, more food and so on. And so what I did was take by decade, the linear fits of these, and it looked like that relationship was sort of deteriorating a bit over time. And I haven't updated this since about 2015, so I don't have the rest of the 2010s in here. Um, but that's sort of troubling, right? If this is a metric you're using to manage a fishery and understand the dynamics, and then that's starting to deteriorating. So our question was, how are these climate change uh, variables going to come into play, including ocean acidification and temperature? So here's a here's the uh, I guess the V1 version of our seawater system. It's been updated since this. In the background, there is uh, Jessamine, who is a master student of mine, did some other work and an undergrad, David. Um, this was, we had to go out and collect the shrimp. So we actually contracted fishermen and went out on two different cruises, one in 18 and one in 19. If you can believe this, this was uh, April on the uh, Oregon coast. So fortunately for me, it was nice and calm so I don't do well usually. Um, and then what we did in the lab was we collected the gravid females with the fishermen, brought them back to the lab, hatched them, and then set up in 2018, we had, we had very few shrimp. I think we had 15 gravid females from fishing all day. It was a late cruise because the fishermen were fighting about pricing with the processors. So I told the fishermen that those were the most valuable 15 pink shrimp he's ever caught in his life. Um, and then 2019, we got a bigger batch. But in 2018, partially because we didn't have very many females, we just did the pH values at one temperature. In 2019, we did a full cross between temperature and pH. And then we measure growth rate uh, by sampling uh, shrimp from the buckets. We had three replicate buckets in each treatment. And then looking at stage and size, and uh, then also did a qualitative measure of mortality, as well as measure respiration rate, uh, looking at oxygen and as well as ammonium uh, excretion. So here's what they look like. It was kind of nice working with oyster larvae. Can't really see them very well. These, if you look closely, you can see kind of neat little larval critters there. These are pretty young. 
And we had to use a size of stage model because the way they were spawning was sort of trickle spawning. So we couldn't age every larvae in every bucket. So what we did was essentially look at how big the larvae were at each stage in each bucket, because it took about a month for us to fully stock all the buckets as they were going. Okay, so this was 2018 data. Uh, we have growth rate, so this is all millimeters per stage. So it's effectively how big per each stage are they growing? And uh, looks like there are some pH effects. And if we look at this, we go, it's about 17% decrease in growth rate going from about a pH of eight down to just under seven, seven, which is, this is fairly low, but not unprecedented in sort of strong upwelling water. Um, but a lot of variance, right? A lot of variance in those data. So 2019, let's repeat it, make sure we see the same pattern. And we didn't, so it's usual. My chemistry background friends always say, you only take one measurement if you do it right, right? But ecologists know better than that. So, so but we did find what I think was kind of interesting is, so I've got this set to temperature here. Temperature's increasing this way. And I've got these low mid control, which is about eight and then high is about 8.2. So in some of these, uh, the, in the high pH, we do see a decrease in growth rate. Um, and we do see the highest growth rate in the high pH, but we also see the lowest growth rate in the control. And that's not good, right? I mean, there's no way to explain that pattern necessarily, but I'll try with a couple more measurements here. So um, it's possible that the pH might have had different effects at different temperatures. It's possible sometimes multi-stressors interact in different ways on the physiology, but um, I'll show you a couple of things that I think we maybe just had some problems in the experimental system somewhere. But, okay, I take out the eight that looked really bad, and we had a seven, six at seven, six, they grew really well. If I take those out and compare the two years, that looks like a fairly robust relationship, but I can't justify that. So I'm just showing you that, that it looks like there's possibly something there, but um, that's just how experiments with organisms go sometimes. Okay, so we also looked at um, some other measures like mortality. Uh, and we did this by simply counting how many shrimp were, or how many buckets we had left at the end of the experiment, right? Because we're sampling the same amount of shrimp from each bucket every, every week. And then we, which buckets run out of shrimp first? So it's semi, it's qualitative really. And so what we saw was at 14, by the end of the experiment, there was nothing left. And at 11, we had sort of a mix, right? And clearly seven, six, things were happier than eight. And again, I can't explain that. Um, but I think there is some problem here. So, um, so similar to what Roethlisberg found was 14 was not good for shrimp larvae. And um, some other work on congener species have found that the pH isn't really a big effect on the shrimp larvae. So OA maybe isn't a big deal for a pink shrimp, which is good, right? <clears throat> uh, just to sort of touch on some of this respiration rates, we did this in these little tiny, uh, two mil vials um, and measured uh, oxygen uptake. And so predictably we see an increase in respiration rate with temperature. Um, here is the growth rate against respiration rate for each of those pH treatments. And I think, again, there's a seven, six, and there's the eight, which are kind of flipped. And so I keep coming back to, and I can't tell you how many times Michelle has heard from me, are you sure you got the labels right? on the data, are you sure you got it right on your vials, are you sure you wrote it right in the book? But that's what we have. And so, but there's kind of interesting, we see this relationship, right, between growth rate and respiration rate, but not, not um, entirely unexpected. Just quickly, this is oxygen to nitrogen ratio. It's something that can be used. So how much oxygen is being consumed versus how much nitrogen is released. It's something that can be used to look at metabolic state and um, I've got these color coded by temperature and pH. So very little really trend in pH and not a lot of real defensible pattern, but generally a higher oxygen nitrogen ratio at the warmer temperatures, which can indicate that they're spending more energy on just trying to maintain uh, their sort of systems rather than actually anabolizing or digesting food and releasing nitrogen. So, um, Okay, let me keep moving here. Okay, so some take-homes. 
temperature is probably more important than OA for pink shrimp larvae. These are similar to findings that um, Ray Benkman did on uh, Pandalus borealis, which is a congener species that are found in northern Pacific as well as the Atlantic. Um, we did see some moderate increases in growth with temperature and maybe decreased with OA. Uh, we did certainly see a lot of appears to be mortality. We did a really rough logistic regression. We estimated about a twofold, two times increase in the probability of mortality with each degree C increase in temperature. Um, and so this really points to things like marine heat waves and El Nino events and things we've been, many people on, around here have been thinking about for quite a bit. Okay, on the juvenile oysters. Um, <clears throat> so a uh, whole lot of students have engaged with this and um, lots of Sea Grant support and some work that's earned underway with the Oregon Science Trust. So I'm gonna do kind of three parts to this, kind of three different projects. Part of it is some work Jessamine Johnson, uh, former master student of mine, uh, conducted Annalise Hedinger when she was actually a postdoc briefly in my lab, some other grad students, lots of undergrads and current students in the lab as well. And so we've done a lot of work and everybody's heard about oyster larvae being very sensitive to ocean acidification. And that's good to know. And then the question is, well, what happens in the field? How sensitive are the juveniles? And can we understand do they reach a size at which they actually are resilient to OA and so on? So that's been the motivation for this is to try to help close the life cycle in a sense and understand what about these other points? Is it really just a matter if we got to get the oyster larvae through and then they're good and we don't have to worry about them anymore? And what kind of effects do we see? Okay. So the three parts, oysters in the lab under food and acidification, oysters in the field, uh, with and without seagrass, and then oysters throughout an estuary with varying conditions, which is the work that's underway now. So uh, again, as I said, we know fairly well the larval responses, and so we want to understand juveniles and beyond. And one of my real sort of passions and interests for a long time since I was in Maryland was really sort of, what do we put this all together, and what does it mean for shell budgets in places? You know, clams, oysters, bivalves, they're gregarious, they like to settle with other shell material. And so if shells are dissolving faster in those systems or they can't make shells fast enough, does that mean that there's a sort of longer term problem for those ecosystems? In fact, some colleagues of mine back in Chesapeake Bay, Roger Mann, Eric Powell, have a paper from about 12 years ago or more arguing that we should just stop trying to restore oysters at Chesapeake Bay because their growth rates can't keep up with sea level rise and they'll just become buried eventually. And there's some things to discuss in that aspect, but, but ultimately it's more than just larvae, right? We gotta get them growing, making shells, contributing shells to that system and so on. Okay, so the uh, food and OA experiments, these are not crossed. These were experiments we ran at the Whiskey Creek Shellfish Hatchery. We were able to set up a system up there where we had actually six levels of treatments we could do. So we ran two experiments, one on food, varying uh, cell density of food from zero to 300,000 cells per mil per day. And then one on acidification ranging from 7.3 to 8.55 pH. And if you're a keen observer of carbonate chemistry, you'll see that they, these seem high for those pHs. And that's because we were using the buffered water in the seawater system there. The hatchery buffers all their seawater and effectively what that does is increase the alkalinity. So we have to add more CO2 to lower the pH. And so we get a, actually a lower pH, but still having a system that's somewhat saturated. Uh, oysters are set on tiles. We destructively sampled them over a month post-settlement, looked at tissue and shell growth um, and developed these staining kits that we distributed to a number of growers, um, ultimately that they're able to stain and measure tissue and shell growth with a cell phone. And I'll show you how we did that in a minute, which is kind of neat. So these are some pictures from microscope in our lab. And then these are pictures actually with a cell phone. We use this little clip-on camera and we gave them the stains. We swapped out bulbs and uh, LED flashlights to get our, our blue light excitation light, put barrier filters in those lenses. And voila, we've basically got fluorescence, uh, epifluorescence uh, that anyone can do with for about 500 bucks. Okay, so we use two stains for those. One's calcium, which is a calcium-based stain. 
that has this fluorescent property that gets incorporated into calcium carbonate material and then can sort of look at shell growth and then Nile red, which is a lipid stain. The calcium is a live stain so that organisms don't die. The Nile red is something that kills, the process will kill the oysters. These are what the kits look like that we shipped out. We gave them a little key to sort of generally, you know, if you see your oysters looking like this, they're good. And if they're looking like this, they're not good. Okay, so just to show that we were able to demonstrate uh, some reliability of this, here we have the total lipid content per oyster. So this is measured. And then this is the Nile red area. So done by those staining kits. We see a pretty good correlation between those, right? And again, we're not trying to precisely measure this, but give sort of a tool for growers to be able to assess this more rapidly in the field. And then this is the calcium area on the y-axis for both of these. This is total shell weight of the oysters as well as the shell area. And so we see a very good relationship between those, which sort of helps uh, give us some confidence that they actually can capture those processes. Okay, so let me show you some of our experimental data. So I'm gonna just put this into a, a four-way sort of thing here. I'm gonna show you the food experiments first, the calcification and tissue growth, uh, and will be on the top, and then the acidification responses on the bottom. Changing the food over a month, growth didn't really change that calcification rate. We saw small differences in the total area of the shell, but very little difference in the size of the shell or, or the total calcification, which is surprising, right? We think you need food to grow. Um, however, we did see a very strong relationship with the tissue growth. And again, this comes back to really trying to understand the physiology of these things and recognizing different stressors are gonna change different components of the physiology. And while they're all connected through the organism, shell growth has a set of different controls than something like tissue growth. And there's still energy at the end that is needed for both of those, but the responses are seemingly different. Predictably, we saw a big, as we predicted, we saw a relatively strong relationship with uh, acidification and the calcium, calcification, a lot of error here though, you see a lot of variance. This was sort of striking. So this was too good, too much buffering. 8.5 saturation state for calcite was about 8.5. We're actually getting close to the point that things are just start precipitating on their own. And so that's what we think was happening here is there actually were, was, it was too good. And we kind of wanted to see where that point was. And we also did see some tissue growth effects here as well for the ocean acidification impacts. Okay, so take home, food and OA have differential effects on shell and tissue growth, um, but recognizably that can't happen forever, right? Can't have a shell that keeps growing and tissue that doesn't. So this is just over a month long period, but there's a lot of plasticity in bivalves in particular. And so there's a lot of flexibility in how they manage this stuff. So even if you have some of these exposures in dynamic systems that might be temporary, it can often recover. Um, we sort of demonstrated the staining kits work, we can put these together for about 500 bucks. We'd sent out nearly two dozen of those. We had originally tried to set up a interface. They could upload pictures. We were gonna automate that whole process and just never the money and time just didn't persist. And I don't really know how many are still using them. I, Alan occasionally at the hatchery tells me they do. Okay, part two, it's a whirlwind tour. So um, oysters in the field under OA and seagrass. And so we're not really manipulating anything here. Uh, this was a master's work, a former student of mine, Stephanie did. And what we did is we had four sites, inside and outside, Zostri Marina beds. Um, so we had a control at a similar tidal height and then inside and outside Zostri japonica, which is an invasive species. And again, similar tidal heights. <clears throat> this experiment ran May to September, 2015. What we did was take 10 day old uh, juvenile. So post set, 10 days post set and um, deploy them at each site monthly over those four months. So every month we put a new set of oysters out because the conditions throughout the season kind of change. And we also know they get a little bit more hardy. So we wanna to try to capture in that early two month window, how sensitive they are. We sampled each cohort every two weeks for that two month period. Stephanie also developed based on some former work by Burkell student, a low cost, uh, CO2 sensor that also had oxygen, light, and temperature in there. And so we could actually measure conditions inside and outside of these beds. 
And then we also measured uh, seagrass parameters as well, uh, leaf area index, biomass epiphytes, and so on. So this is what it looks like in the field if you're an oyster. Uh, I'll just let that hurt your head for a minute. Um, so let me just walk you through this slowly. Um, the blue lines here are temperature. And the kind of drivers here are going to be the tide, which are these gray lines. It's a predicted tide. And the yellow dots is uh, these par, which is on here. That's light, how much light is, is uh, being sort of transmitted. And then you'll see we have, it's really kind of hard to differentiate a bit, but these lighter blue circles are the control sites and the green are the uh, marina bed CO2. And so a few things you see is that these low tides, you see things kind of return close to that 400 level. In some cases, because the tide is actually out and the sensor is just measuring air. Um, in many cases though, depending on the, the alignment of these, you can see in a low, not as low a tide, you'll see we get below atmospheric CO2 conditions. And what we effectively found was over the course of the season, the one consistent thing we found in the seagrass beds, particularly the marina beds, was that their daily low was often below atmospheric conditions. They were often below 400 degrees. Despite Neatards Bay, those of you who know it, huge amount of water tidal fluctuation, right? We were sort of shocked almost that we were actually seeing that those differences there, given how much uh, tidal exchange there was. These numbers up top are actual CO2 values that were above 2000. So right, our current atmosphere is about 415. So these almost always occur right as the tide's coming back in. And we think that what's happening is we're flushing a lot of that pour water out of the system and we're getting these persist for um, sometimes an hour. We're getting these conditions like over 1500 to 1000 that isn't really the upwelling signal from the ocean. It's really a tidal estuarine impact from the pore water because the pore water is very high in metabolic carbon. Okay, so what do the oysters do? Well, this is the growth rate proportion of shell growth and per day in the marina bed here, they grew almost twice as fast as everywhere else. Um, and these were not statistically different from one another. Just visually, these are shells. These are oysters set on shells that were grown in the control site. Uh, and the same age oyster is grown in the marina bed. Is that a CO2 effect? Maybe. Um, but clearly they're growing better in the seagrass bed. I thought this was kind of interesting. This is the shell growth versus seagrass growth. And so seagrass growth on the x-axis Zero means that the seagrasses are basically dying, right? That the sort of biomass is decreasing and the shell growth here shows that they're all growing in all sites. But what was really sort of interesting was over those four months, the, high, the higher the seagrass growth rate was, the more the oysters were growing. And again, it's a correlation. It's possible there's causation there, but it could just be the general conditions were better. And typically what we saw, this is early in the season and this progresses later in the season. So this is sort of late in the season, things are starting to die out, August, September, also higher upwelling intensity. Okay, um, I'm gonna jump through this just to move us along. Uh, what I wanted to show was one of the things we did with some of this data, which we have this really high frequency data, was look at how the CO2 is changing inside and outside the seagrass beds between day and night. And so what this on the y-axis here is the change in PCO2 in PPM per hour. And then the gray bars are nighttime values and the open bars are during the day. And uh, we have the marina site, we have the control site. And then we looked at that compared to the Whiskey Creek shellfish hatchery monitoring system, the percolator that's there, just to sort of verify that we were seeing things that were similar and we see nighttime the respiratory signal is pretty similar, but during the day, this is almost 60 ppm per hour that we're seeing over this week, the seagrass appear to be pulling down that CO2, which is quite impressive. Okay, is that fast enough? We've got a couple more. One more part for oysters, then we'll move on to shells. I got a couple of shell slides. Okay, so part three here is now we're gonna look at oysters in the field, and this is, uh, work that's been supported by Sea Grant and continued with uh, the Oregon um, Ocean Science Trust. 
So this is a, this hopefully looks familiar to all of you, Jacona Bay, and these are sites we've been monitoring out here. Some of these sites since 2018 at this point. So in 2018, we started with a honors college thesis project where we had temperature and salinity sensors at Hatfield, at Oregon Oyster, and up here at Paddle Park. And then we put out oysters to grow there as well as shells to look at dissolution rates. And then we took discrete samples of things like carbonate chemistry and particulates for food and um, did some nutrient sampling as well. And we've been expanding this as we go. And so now we have multiple sites that have time series data there for temperature and salinity primarily. Some places we have surface and bottom, like Sawyer's Landing, we have some sensors at depth and then near the surface. Um, and then we have uh, oysters we've deployed at, uh, deployed at five of these locations. And, um, and we've also done the shell dissolution rates I measured. And so the oyster growth, we did one run, I guess that was back in 20, it was during the pandemic, we were doing some of this 2019, 2020. We had oysters set on tiles and shells at the three primary sites. Just this past, I guess that was June, we deployed 100 Olympia oysters at five sites and 50 Pacific oysters at those same five sites and cages hanging off the dock. And then I've been going back and, and measuring their growth rates um, as well as turning these sensors around. And then we've also been doing some, um, I'll show you some of this data. We've been doing some tracks with a small boat. And so Jim Larzak is part of the work with Jim. Some of you are familiar with, Jim had a student years ago, Emily Lamage. They had a, a physical model of Yukona Bay that they put together to look at sort of larval flushing. And so Jim's been continuing that work to improve the model. So we actually have done AD CP transects through here to look at the physics and different tidal states. Um, and as well, I've built this little flow through seawater system on the Donny R. So it's a 16, 17 foot aluminum boat. Um, it's been handed down through the college for years now. I think this goes back to actually when Tony D'Andrea was faculty at the college. Um, so we've now have a back here, We've got a seawater intake and a small pump that pumps water up along underneath the gunnel. And we've plumbed that into a CO2 sensor. And we've got a TSG for doing temperature and salinity. We could put a fluorometer on there if we wanted. And we've got GPS. And so we can actually do spatial transects around the bay now. So I'm just saying there's opportunities for easy, relatively cheap, much cheaper than taking the Alaka out for doing stuff if people are interested. And I'm happy to explore that because I get to go drive a boat. Okay, so I know this is a little hard to see. I figured you'd all sort of be familiar with the general shape here. The, um, this, this is up to about, I think, 800 here. This was a, a set of measurements we did in June this past summer. Um, coming in from the ocean side here, we have to run the boat somewhat slowly to not pull too much air into that intake. But this is a CO2 and you can see, so low CO2, high CO2 from blue to yellow. As we go up this range of CO2 from about 400 or so down near the mouth here, up to about 7, 800 up past Paddle Park. Um, the other interesting thing we did, and we managed to do this without, I think, causing too much chaos and destruction was we went over the seagrass bed just to see sort of middle of the day, if we could see a signal and we actually saw measured in the surface water, we did actually see a, a, about a 50 to 75 PPM drop in CO2 from the surrounding water. So. So part of what we're trying to do is sort of understand some of the dynamics with these sloughs and other parts of the bay and how they're contributing to the carbon budget. This was a run we did back in September. And again, you can see uh, blue to yellow, similar dynamics. We have a site uh, up here with some sensors in pool slough, and we sort of made our way up in pool slough as well um, to sort of uh, look at some of those CO2 dynamics. And so, Really, from a carbonate chemistry perspective and the interest of acidification, the interesting things that happen in an estuary from that chemistry side is that we have changes in alkalinity with salinity. So that thing about buffering, right? And how much it's gonna resist pH change. The fresher the water, the lower the alkalinity usually. So as a tidal change changes in a location, as well as the seasonal changes, all this rainwater we get right now lowers that alkalinity quite a bit, as well as the metabolism. Right, so more respiration, more CO2 also creates similar conditions to acidification and all that compounds with this global background change of a baseline shift. 
<clears throat> okay. So uh, this is work Marlena Penn's MRM student in my lab currently uh, has been sort of spearheading. And um, I should mention Margaret Connolly. I think I had her name somewhere in here as well. Margaret's been doing a lot of the sensor maintenance. Uh, and Margaret's actually developing a thermal model of Equina Bay with the sort of mixing and physical model that Jim has. And with the hope that we actually do some projections of climate change impacts of where temperature habitats over spatial area might increase or change in terms of being habitable for different critters. All this is preliminary. So like I said, we just started this this year. So, um, but I thought you guys would be interested in seeing this. So the Olympia oyster data uh, is right here. I have an area and mass growth. And so what we've been doing is we've got them out in cages. We pull them on our sample uh, frequency. We'll lay them out on a black towel, take a picture. We can run that through an image analysis and get the area so we can measure area change over time. And then we've been weighing them every time we go out there as well. And so that's just the total mass. We will soon go out and start pulling some tissue samples as well destructively. So um, this is just the average temperature during the deployment period for these five sites. And what's interesting is you can see the area and mass growth curves aren't perfect, right? They don't align or fall on top of each other. Um, and we can see that there is some increase in growth with temperature and then maybe possibly some decrease as it gets a little bit warmer for the Olympia oysters. And again, I, I don't know if that's real or not because here we have this a lot of, uh, one of the highest sites for total mass growth but the area didn't change. And so some of this could also be shell morphology because these are not set on anything, they're independent. So if they're changing the shape, that might be also part of it. Here are the Pacific oyster data we have thus far. Um, you'll notice these axes are quite different, right? Quite a bit bigger, higher growth rates. Uh, again, similar, you see these increases in growth and I'm not sure if we're seeing decreases there. Um, what I did do is pull out our maximum temperature from these the, uh, sensor deployments. And this is just the Pacific oyster growth. And I thought that was really interesting that we see this as the temperature is generally higher or frequently higher, we see higher growth rates as well. So again, because even though the average is capturing some ca component of the dynamics, often the extreme conditions might be the things that are becoming important and maybe good or maybe bad. Okay. So um, we're still compiling discrete samples. So we've been pulling carbonate chemistry samples and running those in Burke Hales' lab for the uh, last few years, get some of these other sites. We're doing more of these spatial surveys. And um, we have one pH sensor we deployed uh, back in spring, uh, actually at the oyster farm here. And the, the sort of variability was off the chart. That was a, a tremendous rainfall event we had. We had pH that varied actually in the estuary here from six and a half to eight in six hours. Salinity went from zero to 15, right? So, and what's interesting, that rainfall event from talking with Lou at the oyster farm, they were months behind on production this year because that cold, wet water slowed everything down happening there. So this is the aspect of the climate change in OA that's really hard to get a handle on is because in these systems, that variability becomes really important in life history stage, timing, and all kinds of other dynamics. And it's really hard to pinpoint these down without having these types of measurements and time series data. Okay, on the shells, uh, really the questions here, uh, a fundamental question that frankly, we hasn't been a lot of work on, believe it or not, is how fast do shells dissolve? People hadn't made many of these measurements. I did some of this in, in Maryland and we've done some of this here now. Um, Tristan Myers, who is a former master student of mine, uh, has, has spearheaded a bunch of this work. A bunch of other people also contributed along the way. And um, then the secondary question is, can we put shells back out in the environment to help with this OAE thing, right? Putting that alkalinity back into the environment and creating a sort of antacid we could use to work against the metabolic carbon. Okay, so just to visually put this into perspective, so these were shells deploy, they were roughly the same size, one at Hatfield and two of these from Paddle Park. This is one year later. So this is how much they dissolved just up the estuary at Paddle Park and very little dissolution at Hatfield. Just to give you an idea of just through that sense of the estuary, how much variability there is in the 
the persistence of those shells, right? And it starts to speak to how well those habitats may or may not support shell building things. And as we increase that background CO2 again, we're gonna shrink the environments that are gonna be suitable for these things to make shells and for those shells to persist. So we measured the actual dissolution rates. We did this by measuring the mass of the shells over time. And so, uh, and then these are the saturation states or how corrosive the water is. So this is effectively Paddle Park, the oyster farm in Hatfield. And then what was surprising to me is the Olympia oysters actually were dissolving faster on a per mass basis uh, per month. And these rates, if you put this in percentage, this is about 4% per month dissolution rate. It's sort of Think about that, that how much material is dissolving there. 4% of that, that shell is dissolving each month. Um, and it, but very predictably fits this kind of relationship where we would expect uh, this thermodynamic equilibrium here and increasing dissolution with lower saturation states. Okay, so last little bit here is sort of then thinking about buffering potential. Uh, this is work, the Columbia Carbonate, Columbia River Carbonates, which is a, actually an agricultural company that builds soil amendments or uh, from mining practices up in the Columbia Gorge. Been working with them for a few years. They're actually giving us materials for the shells. This is how we break up shells. So this is actually a picture in my shop at my house and my, my property and several of our grad students probably doing things that the lawyers and safety people would not really be very conducive of. I think Jaquan's got a, a tow bar from my tractor in there, pounding up some shells in a little coffee can. Um, anyway, but the idea was to grind up the shells and put them back out and compare that to other minerals, things like calcite and dolomite and so on. Um, so the first thing Tristan did in her thesis was actually measure the dissolution rates of these different minerals under different saturation states. So this is dissolution rate uh, as a function of alkalinity. So we're saying how many millimoles of alkalinity per gram of mineral per day. And then this is the saturation state for each of these minerals. And so the calcite, bioaragonite, biocalcite, or clam and oyster shells, respectively, dolomites, uh, calcium magnesium carbonate, and then calcite is just calcium carbonate. Uh, that's not biologically, originally, originally all this stuff is biological, well, calcite's um, biologically derived, but at this point it's been mined. It's gone through late diagenesis and so on. So what you'll see here, the first thing is the interesting thing about dolomite. This is what's referred to as a dolomite problem. Despite the saturation states appearing to be incredibly super saturated, it still dissolves in the ocean. And as far as I can tell, the geochemists still don't really fully understand why that is. And that's why it's called the dolomite problem. But it's been a mineral that's been proposed to sort of look at buffering and putting alkalinity back in and increasing buffering capacity. What you'll notice is that the shells have these much higher dissolution rates with similar saturation states than the calcite mineral. And even more fascinating is they all converge at zero. And it's a fundamentally a shift. It's kind of real nerdy chemistry stuff, but it's a shift in the controls on dissolution from one sort of mode of physical chemistry to another. This was done with uh, RO water. The rest of this was seawater. And that also changes the dynamics in terms of the ions and things that are there. So then the question is, what if we put these things out in the field? How do they respond to changes in the environment? So what they do is take those uh, curves, just look at the slopes of those. So per each unit decrease in saturation, per 0.1 decrease in saturation state, how much alkalinity do they generate? And the oysters, the biocalcite, have the highest rate of alkalinity generation or the most sensitive to dissolving as you decrease that saturation state, followed by dolomite, and then aragonite, and then calcite. And then we did a bunch of work on olivine, which is something that's also been proposed to go out as a way to buffer to counteract ocean acidification. It's a silica-based mineral with iron and magnesium in there. It's been proposed because it's the oceans are undersaturated with respect to olivine, and um, but it dissolves really slowly. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff. So we're not gonna talk much more, but it's, it's kind of interesting. I'm happy to chat about it. Okay, so now we wanna do is put this stuff in the sediment and see what happens, right? See if we can actually generate changes in the alkalinity flux in the sediment. And the reason we wanna do this in sediment is because sediments have lots of CO2 from the natural metabolism. And so that gives us a mechanism to help dissolve these minerals more quickly. And it also helps to buffer that metabolic carbon and everything else in the environment. 
Um, so let me show you this. These are first some experiments we did with intact cores. So right out here, went out and took four inch diameter cores, brought them back to the lab, amended them with different minerals at 16% weight by weight and held them under different um, CO2 conditions. And so this is the average by mineral. And this is the enhancement from the pre to post buffering. So we measured what the alkalinity fluxes were before we amended them and then amended them and ran that for almost two months and continued to measure to see how they held up. So it's also uh, averaging over time. So you see that here's a control, right? Basically zero. We didn't see much enhancement with dolomite, but both the calcite and the biocalcite had uh, 10 millimole or so increase. And that's about a 25% increase in the alkalinity flux that from those systems. But it was real messy. It was real hard, right? All these experiments. So what we did is a follow-up experiment where we took sediment, brought it back, homogenized it because we had critters and there's all these kinds of interesting things happening in the intact cores. Got rid of all the critters, put the sediment back together. And then we had this question about was 16% too much? So we did, uh, here's our control, an 8% and a 16%. And then at these different saturation states. And what we see is lower saturation states, no mineral amended. There's some natural dissolution of minerals happening there. 8%, we get this enhancement. The enhancement's greatest at the lowest saturation state. And then at 16, they all kind of come back and converge again. And we think what's happening in this case is that it's actually being over buffered. There's just too much mineral there and it, it changes the exchange dynamics. It changes a lot of the other properties. Tristan in her thesis actually looked at whether we were diluting the amount of organic matter enough to change the reaction rates of the sediment and so on, which we think was part of what was happening. So in these cores in the lab, diffusion is the only mechanism for removing the alkalinity, right? In these sediments out here, we get transport and other processes and advection that are gonna help move water through there more quickly. Um, and what's happening often is if, as you dissolve this stuff, if you're not removing it, the system becomes self-buffering at some point. And ultimately what we see is the metabolic carbon, as well as these transport dynamics are gonna be really important in how well this may or may not work. A colleague of mine on this project in Maine who's been doing this has found that he can keep adding shell and it keeps buffering. And he's working in really muddy sediments that have lots of organic matter. And the sediments we're working in have been a little bit sandier. We have experiments running up in British Columbia on really sandy sediments and we expect we're not gonna see very much up there. Okay. This is my last slide. So we've done this in the field as well. These are plots, different amounts of mineral. This was an experiment we set up last fall. And uh, my student Jaquan has been out there doing pore water measurements starting in March. And he's got dozens and dozens of pore water profiles and it's real ugly. Um, we're not seeing consistent things. We can see some predictable patterns. We had that real heavy rainfall in April. We could see that in the alkalinity profiles, the, the sediment was actually lower alkalinity. And, um, and I think that all this stuff is just trying to put it all together has been really challenging. So he's working on it and um, he's just finished up some of those uh, measurements recently. And so he's this ongoing work he's doing. So I finished right at 4.30. I think I was supposed to finish a little earlier, but uh, that's it. Any questions? All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll go ahead and open questions for a little while, and then maybe you can stick around for sure, a yeah. few Happy after to. that. Yep. Um, so uh, start with questions online. Are there any questions online yet? Okay. For folks online, go ahead and put your questions into the chat, and we'll work through them for folks in the room. Got John. Thank you. That was a, a landslide of data. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> it's been a while, like I said. <laughs> the, um, on, on the... Um, the pH and the calcification and the exchange of minerals, the the metabolic um, um, carbonates that are available or something. What do those mass balances say for an estuary? If you're going to change, have a climate change effect, and you're going to do something about it, what are you know what are we talking about? Is this something that is actually is practical, or is this something that contributes to something? You mean doing this estuary? Yeah, high. like yeah. Say we're going to solve the world's problems. What well, well, here's like? the first thing I'll say. We won't solve the world's problems by buffering Aquina. <laughs> and so so my my take on all of this has been more 
along the lines of, can we create refugia? There are people who are interested in doing this in the ocean, right? And there are people, there's work being done looking at, can we put electrochemical things into tanker ships that are crossing the ocean and basically leaving trails of alkalinity behind them as they go? My interest is really in the habitat level and sort of, and part of what we're doing here with these plots is where we actually have been looking at whether we're getting differences in clam settlement. And the problem we had this year, I think, is that horrible cold, wet spring. We didn't, didn't look like we got any clams more or less out there anywhere in the flats that we found. Um, so my approach really is thinking more about the estuary and the mass balances are tough because Again, we need the conditions to be thermodynamically favorable for dissolution for things like calcite, but they're usually not currently. And so that's why looking at somewhere like a metabolically active system is somewhere you can do this. But the scope for how much alkalinity you can put into a system, so we went up to like Cannon Quarry way up the river, it's still quite a bit smaller and we're not gonna be able to capture tons of CO2 because the system itself doesn't have the ability to capture, to put a lot of that stuff in there. There's a limit, you, you sort of saturate pretty quickly. It's a little counterintuitive, but in the fresher water, you'll reach saturation sooner in some ways. So, so but it's worth a shot, right? We've got to try something in some ways. And, and I'm not suggesting we do this right now, but you know, scaling it up, because this is really probably, in my opinion, Either this or electrochemical techniques is one of the only ways we're going to really be able to do this in seawater in some appreciable way. So following with that, if you're looking at a mudflat and you're yep. looking at where the algae grow or where different clams are or shrimp burrow or yep. something, there's an incredible heterogeneity out there. Yep. So it's not a, uh, it's definitely absolutely not homogeneous. Yeah. And part of that has to be because the animals have to choose where they are. And once they do, they can't get away. Yep. But if you're looking at larvae in the ocean, they get to make choices. How, how closely do things you match up on pig shrimp, their outcomes, for instance, the temperatures, do they choose where their temperature is? How, how much choice do they get? Well, the, the larvae will vertically migrate, right? And I, you know, so they can't fight the current, but they can vertically migrate. And so what we were hoping to do on that Crews of the ODF and W folks was actually look at swing responses to high, increase CO2. Because the what the Roethlisberg dissertation, his work did was really interesting was that the depending on how late stage the larvae were, that changed the degree of diurnal vertical migration. And so the older ones, the younger ones stay closer to the surface. The older ones tended to migrate more until they've eventually just settled near bottom. And so um, so, I, I, you know, I don't know that they can pick, they can sort of orient and it seems to be that it's a light, right, response. So I don't know if they can actually, right, and if they migrate to colder water, that's going to typically be higher CO2 in the upwelled water. So I, I'm not answering your question, I guess, is what I'm saying. But, but um, uh, you know, I think they're subjected to these bigger oceanographic phenomenon, right? temperature-wise, these marine heat waves and so on that we're seeing globally happening more and more. And, and so, I don't know. And again, because more El Ninos, more La Ninas, right? That's going to change those temperature dynamics and clearly have some effect on the recruitment into the fishery as well. Okay, I'm going to pull it back to online. No questions there. All right, how about other questions in the room? All right, hang on a second, Greg. <clears throat> Amazing yeah. talk, tremendous amount of data. Not sure I processed a whole lot of it. Well, I think but, Simon recorded it, so you guys can go back <laughs> and email uh, me questions later. Yeah, but building on the what you just said about you know uh, marine heat waves, La Nina, and things like that. I mean, we're looking at things that the two of them aren't even always the same, right? We've got three years of La Nina yeah. now, right? We're in our third year. We also have one of the fairly largest, uh, you know, maybe fourth or so marine heat waves that's been going on. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, even spatially, they're not necessarily the same, you know, where the marine heat waves are oftentimes – 
they stay a bit further offshore mm -hmm. and we might get good upwelling in a year that has a marine heat wave. And so what I guess I'm trying to say is when it, it, it's really hard to tease things out yeah. and, you know, so especially with field work. So I'm just wondering, do you think that, you know, you, you mentioned that in a lot of your stuff, but is there a hope of being able to do it in that sort of thing? Or is it, or, or do you just really need to rely on the lab studies to, to get um, a handle? Yeah, I, I think we have to try, right? And I think it is hard because for everything that you think you've measured that's going to be important, you'll find one thing that you didn't measure that becomes maybe the most important thing. So a great example of that was the 2015 um, pseudonychia bloom we had, right? It was unprecedented levels of demoic acid along the coast. We were running experiments with larvae up at the hatchery and previous year, student of mine, Idia Gimenez was, and what we were trying to do was develop effectively a, a degree day type model for oyster larvae, right? To sort of look at accumulated stress over a period of time. And would that predict sort of growth and fitness because we have, right, these wildly varying conditions. And so we ran two year, two experiments the previous year and got a really nice, actually I think three even, we got really nice relationships, right? With the sort of amount of time crossing a threshold. So we sort of sum up, integrate the amount of time over a threshold and looked at the overall larval growth. Summer 2015, early we set this up and everything's backwards. That year, high pH was making all the larvae die and low pH, they were doing better. And I start going, did you label the vials right? Do we have the tags right? You, you have to go through that stuff. And then um, we were never able to show this explicitly, but there's some literature that suggests that demoic acid can become more toxic under high pH. And so what we found or what we saw was effectively that this, this experiment, we saw this absolutely opposite response of all the work we've done before. And it turned out maybe it was demoic acid there. So. So, I mean, there's a limit to the lab stuff always, and you're never gonna be able to capture everything. And the best we can do is try to get the things we think are most important, but you know, we're always gonna get hit with a curveball at some point. So, so I think it speaks to the, all the work that's yet to be done, right? And it speaks to the fact of how we have to think about these life history stages. And you know, do we care about a global average versus a local average over a whole season versus some measure of the dynamics? And then the need and the importance of the monitoring side of stuff that we have the measurements to be able to document actually what the conditions are and how they're changing. So, so I, I would say that by no means will the lab work fill in all the cracks. What it helps, I think in my mind, the lab work does, it might help us figure out what some thresholds could be, but it also helps us understand maybe mechanisms and then we try to go back out in the field and figure out how those things are interacting there. Another great example of that in the hypoxia world, some work that Chris Gobler did years ago after him and I had chatted about some of this for a while. <clears throat> so all the hypoxia thresholds, most of them have been established by bubbling nitrogen into seawater, measuring how things do, right? Sort of, sort of tons of experiments on fish and crabs and all kinds of stuff. And those thresholds get set based on those lab experiments. Do you know what happens when you bubble nitrogen in the seawater though? You take all the CO2 out. And so what happens is if somebody was measuring the pH, when you make hypoxia or anoxia in seawater from nitrogen, your pH is 9.5, right? So now <clears throat> in the field, natural systems, you would see some relationship where you would have low oxygen, high CO2, but in the lab where we've used to set these thresholds, we've actually decoupled those and probably the thresholds are probably set too low because we're not accounting for some of those CO2 effects. So that was a paper he published, I think, four years ago, right? I don't know if anybody's really gone back to try to look at how those hypoxia thresholds hold up either. So, so I, you know, it's, 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 that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, I think you got to do that. I think it's got to be ultimately no none of us are going to solve this with anything we individually we're doing. Collectively, it's got to be lab work, it's got to be field work and it's got to be modeling because we can't do all the lab experiments or all the field measurements. So, and those have to inform the models which then feed back and so on. So, yeah.
it's tough. It's, but it's, I mean, we've got work to do. I guess that's good, right? A yep. lot more work to do. Yep. I think that's the, the way we're okay. going to wrap it up okay. there. Um, so uh, for everybody online, if you have questions, you can reach out to George for folks in the room. It sounds like George might stick around for a few minutes. If you have yep. questions. Um, remember, hopefully we'll see you here next week. Same time, same place. Um, one more thank you for George. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Yeah, you do. Okay, for folks online, we're going to end the presentation now. Remember, we have a recording. If you need it, um, you can join the HMSC website and check out past seminar page in a few days.